Coming up on Network Africa. Researchers in Uganda say the Ebola virus in the country is mutating as the U.S. step up Ebola checks from travelers coming from Uganda. The U.S. accuses Russian mercenaries Wagner Group of using Africa's wealth to fund the war in Ukraine. Russia denies links to the group. Plus, Lesotho holds parliamentary elections amid unresolved political crisis. Hello and a warm welcome to the program today. I'm Layo Olaride. Researchers in Uganda say the Ebola virus in the country has mutated. According to the Uganda Virus Research Institute, there is, however, no evidence that it is any more transmissible than the original strain. They analyzed samples from the first known case to be tested during the current outbreak, which has now spread to five districts in central Uganda. So far, 44 cases have been reported and 10 people have died from the disease. Researchers tracking its spread say the genetic makeup of the virus looks similar to one responsible for another outbreak over a decade ago in the same region. On the 15th of September, Meanwhile, the U.S. will be redirecting travelers who have been to Uganda in the previous 21 days to five airports to screen them for Ebola. At least nine people have died of the disease in Uganda since the Ebola outbreak was announced by health officials on the 20th of September. The U.S. Embassy in Uganda says that out of an abundance of caution, travelers would be redirected to the JFK, Newark, Atlanta, O'Hare, and Dulles airports in the U.S. Officials will be conducting a temperature screening, asking health questions, and report arrivals to local health departments. Well, here in Nigeria, the pipeline surveillance job being jointly conducted by a private security outfit and the government security agency has uncovered a suspected illegal pipe connection to the trans Forcados pipeline in the Yokiri Axis offshore Forcados in the Niger Delta region of Nigeria. According to security operatives in the area, the pipeline, which is believed to be over four kilometers long into the sea, is suspected to have an evacuation point at the Afroma A platform owned by SBDC. Our energy correspondent, Olu Phillips, who has been in the creeks, brings us some details in this exclusive report. They say happiness comes in waves. But beyond this beautiful wave of Yorkery River lies the nefarious activity that has bedeviled the nation's economy, one of several scattered across the South-South region. This is our journey into the nation's oil region found predominantly in the Niger Delta area. In 2014, on these waters, my crew and I were crudely held hostage while chasing an aborted gas project in Ogidigbe. Eight years after, we return to these axis and our destination is the home of the man regarded as the strong man of Guaramatu Kingdom. High Chief Government Owezide Epamupolo, a.k.a. Tompolo. His mien may not easily give him away considering his perceived capacity. He sits with me and speaks to his commitment to a better Nigeria, his determination to crush any group wanting to truncate federal government's efforts at protecting the pipelines, and his optimism on a rebound of crude oil production numbers. A lot of people are now running Elta Skeeter because they know that there is nothing in this country concerning the River Rhine that I don't know. The people in Imo, River State, were all brothers and friends. So once we dis discuss and agree, and that is the more reason why our people in River State, maybe they are, they, they, are, they are going to start any moment from now. Once they are fully engaged, 
and then we will now still call the security people to call their people to order. Mm. Once that is done, then we are good to go. He's not done yet. He makes this weighty allegation. When you are coming from Wari, you see security as boot all over the places. If you look at the old setting, where this illegal bunkering is taking place, if you have one uh, Navy gun boot, one Army gun boot, the extreme end is where the real bunkering is taking place. To get the job started, about 17,000 locals have been brought, briefed, and deployed across the region. To understand the scale of work, we join these young men who are currently providing intelligence about the diverse and difficult terrain of the region to government security agencies. It's a journey that takes us sometimes into the night, speeding and bumping through the unending sea waves just to arrive at locations called camps, where vandals operate by making careful but illegal insertions onto crude lines, traversing the soils of the mangrove swamp and beneath the sea, connecting them through pipelines into reservoir tanks constructed in the bushes where they cook the crude to get diesel, kerosene, and empty the residue onto the environment. Wow. Whilst stealing may be occurring in the creeks, an unsuspecting quantity of crude allegedly leaves the country through illegal connections from the creeks directly into the sea where barges load them and sail off. We've just been tipped off of such legal insertions. Wading through the crude stained parts, we arrive at the scene and it's time for men to go to work. It will involve all measures just to unearth what is believed to be concealed. After hours of work, what do we have? Look at the three pipes here. Now you can see the three pipes clear here. This is the point of a suspected insertion and illegal connection. You can see there are three pipes here. The big one is a national trunk line, which is the Trans Focados trunk line, a 24 inches pipeline. Now, you see those two pipelines on top of it making um, a head knock on the pipe. Professionally, this looks unkept. This looks suspicious because it's tapped on top of a traveling crude line. And the question is, why do we have that insertion on a script top of a 24 inches pipe, double six inches pipe, traveling all the way and it is suspected to be traveling all the way to the, um, to the high sea. This is what we have here. Those two lines traveling. Those two lines traveling. And joining up themselves here, to my mind, it tells me um, it will give it more pressure. Through several coordinates, the line, according to the security guys, has a discharge point in the sea. So we hop up back into the boat and sail off. The river that they rough. Yeah, yeah. The river that they rough. So what is this platform? Share. They will lose this knot and remove it. Yeah, remove the flow. They keep something here to cover the flow of oil. So if they take it now out, then the oil can flow through. Is this about to become the biggest crude heist in federal government's bids to crush all thieves? Most definitely, the last shouldn't be heard of what security operatives here suspect is a major unaccounted offshore fleece point of Nigeria's crude oil. Olu Phillips, Charles Television News. Let's take you back to our leading story for today, the uh, Ebola crisis in Uganda, where researchers say the virus is mutating. Joining us now is Dr. Akiala Ishaku, a public health expert from our Abuja studios. Uh, hello, Dr. Ishaku. Thank you for your time. Oh, the virus is mutating, according to researchers in Uganda. Talk to us about what more steps should be taken to ensure this virus doesn't get out of hand. 
Yeah, I think, uh, thank you for having me. What we need to do more is to look at the local content public health measures uh, to actually go into active surveillance. And all African Union member states need to be on alert. By now, we should be able to get travel advice from uh, African Union member states. I was surprised that we never had travel alerts or al adversary alert from Nigeria. Uh, so it shows that people traveling Uganda or transiting Uganda needs to be placed on high public health watch list. Uh, this is because this is the only way to contain the virus. Because virus don't travel, it is humans that travels with the virus. So it calls on member states to actually keep on alert. We need to also have a paradigm shift to look at our land borders uh, and actually look at our port authority, our health port authority. Uh, we need to actually see to how we can be able to equip this uh, port authority to be able to contain emerging and re-emerging diseases from the lessons we have learned from COVID and the past Ebola. Uh, I, I am also thinking that how, because we have a very porous border uh, in the country, uh, the immigration service here in Nigeria and custom service needs to be well equipped and trained and capacity needs to be built. I was thinking by now uh, the NCDC can be able to shift mandate in terms of border control to Nigeria Immigration and Custom Service, so that we can be able to build their health, capacity of their health unit, that they can be able to contend with emergencies or a health emergency. So in this regard, it is, uh, it is worrisome because the number of cases is rising in Uganda and number of deaths, what we refer to as case fatality rate, it is at increase. Indeed, and that's what we see the U.S. You know, now doing uh, has put in place border checks for travelers coming from Uganda. And you've already, you know, even you've, you've touched on my next question about what control measures should be at our borders, because we definitely do not want a repeat of, you know, the 2014, 2016 Ebola West Africa crisis. Uh, but help us understand what uh, researchers mean by, you know, the virus is mutating and how. Uh, worried one should be. When we say that the virus has mutated, it shows that the virus has changed its genetic makeup. And this can arise in based on several factors. It is maybe the virus has gotten encounter with a different host, so it changes its genetic makeup uh, in terms of getting adapting into the host. Uh, so once the virus of human origin cross to animal origin, because our anatomy and physiology is not the same, it will change its genetic makeup to get adapted into the new host. Maybe perhaps the virus get encounter with an environment, it will also change its genetic makeup and then you know be able to suit into the environment. So once we say that the virus mutate, it shows that the genetic makeup of that virus has changed. It can change for better, maybe losing the vulnerability and the virulence of the virus, or sometimes it increases the vulnerability and the virulence of the virus. And so from what we are seeing in Sudan, I was able to go through some lexicons of literature to actually understand the dynamics of the mutation paradigms. And I just got to discover that one of the first variants that was isolated was totally a Sudan uh, origin-based variant. But the more variants that we are having now tends to have a different phylogenetic uh, uh, tree lineage with the one of 2014 that, would, that causes a huge outbreak in the West African region. So it shows that there has been a change in the genetic makeup of the virus. It calls because there are issues of global warming, uh, there are issues of uh, deforestation, and there are issues of increase in international travels. And so the virus tends to adapt based on changes of environment and also changes in the host. So it calls for a serious concern. Uh, if we are having imagine and reimagine this uh, variant of Ebola within the African region, it shows that we need to actually sit up as a continent 
to have a look at this. I am also proposing that we need a local content in terms of vaccine uh, clinical trials, in terms of even vaccine uh, development. Uh, Lola, why must we have diseases that are endemic in Africa and the vaccines are produced elsewhere? Is mm. it possible for us to build capacity in Africa to be able to simulate and synthesize and produce this vaccine in-house. Right. Uh, of course, that also arising in terms of variants. Why do we take, give our children measles vaccines all the time and they still come down with, uh, uh, you know, measles? The disease, It yeah. shows that we also need to actually carry out a lot of studies when all it comes right. to vaccine, vaccine efficacy because in t vaccine efficacy differs with genetic makeup. Dr. Akiala Ishaku, public health expert, thank you for your thoughts. Thank you for having me. Still ahead on the program. South Africa's Women Economic Assembly is pushing for the participation of women-owned enterprises to foster sustainable economic development. Please join us again. Welcome back to the program. The United States is accusing Russian mercenaries of exploiting natural resources in the Central African Re Republic, Mali, Sudan, and elsewhere to help Moscow fund the war in Ukraine. Well, this is a charge that Russia has rejected as anti-Russian rage. The U.S. Ambassador to the United Nations, Linda Thomas Greenfield, said the Wagner Group of mercenaries are exploiting natural resources and the gains are used to fund Moscow's war machine in Africa, the Middle East and Ukraine. However, Russian UN Ambassador Vasily Nebenzia says he regrets that Thomas Greenfield had raised that issue of Russia support of, of Russian support to African partners. One of the most immediate and growing concerns in Africa is the Kremlin-backed Wagner Group's strategy of exploiting the natural resources of the Central African Republic, Mali and Sudan, as well as other countries. These actions are thoroughly documented and irrefutable. And we know these ill-gotten gains are used to fund Moscow's war machine in Africa, the Middle East, and Ukraine. And rather than being a transparent partner and improving security, Wagner exploits client states who pay for their heavy-handed security services in gold, diamond, timber, and other natural resources. This is part of Wagner Group's business model. Make no mistake, people across Africa are paying a heavy price for the Wagner Group's exploitative practices and human rights violations. Mr. President, in conclusion, I would like to express our regret that the United States in their anti-Russian rage have reached the point where, in their statement, put the issue to the forefront of Russian support to its African partners. This exposes their real plans and aims. What they really need from African countries we're surprised by the words of the permanent representative of the United States when she's talking about client states. That's American terminology. We do not use that. For us, the African countries are not clients. They are partners. I'd like to recall here, by the way, that in Syria, the United States under the cover of counterterrorism are stealing Syrian oil before an, untrust, an untrustworthy company was appointed for that. And then, when the situation seemed too scandalous, even to its allies, the United States returned to stealing Syrian national resources using their own military. Lesotho is holding parliamentary elections with little sign that these will end years of political gridlock in the country. Fifty parties are contesting the Friday poll in the kingdom, which is landlocked inside South Africa. Divisions and defections within the governing ABC party have left it vulnerable to opposition rivals, particularly the Democratic Congress. 
Last month, Lesotho's High Court overturned the state of emergency imposed in August after members of parliament failed to pass a raft of constitutional reforms. Former South African President Jacob Zuma's 15-month jail sentence for contempt of court has come to an end today and he is now a free man. A statement by the Department of Correctional Services confirms that Mr. Zuma has now been released from the correctional services system. The former president was sentenced to 15 months imprisonment for contempt of court in a judgment handed down on the 29th of June 2021. After two months behind bars, he was granted medical parole in September of the same year. The spokesperson for the Correctional Services, Singaboko Nzulmalo, says Mr. Zuma has complied with his parole conditions and with all administrative processes concluded, his sentence has now expired. South Africa's Women Economic Assembly has brought together private sector, business women, government and civil society to talk women's inclusion and participation in the country's economic landscape. This initiative pushes for the participation of women-owned enterprises on the entire value chain to foster sustainable economic development. Our correspondent, Brian Pugeni, files this report. This year's theme for the Women Economic Assembly is unlocking gender responsive value chains for a resilient economy with a focus on showcasing how the public and private sectors have implemented their commitment towards their gender transformation in industry value chains. For too long, we've talked about women only as employees. We're changing that narrative and we're saying that women are business owners. Women are entrepreneurs and we are not living in fantasy world when we say that because women have already been entrepreneurs. They've just been dealing with an ecosystem that's been difficult to break through. Now we corner is in the house and we are busy breaking through those barriers to ensure that these women that own businesses are actually participating in the ecosystem. Given the keynote address, President Cyril Ramaphosa said the reason for starting the assembly was to improve the economic inclusion and participation of women and transform the economy. He also highlighted government's role in enabling that there are more women entrepreneurs in the country. We are committed to using the policy and legislative tools at our disposal, such as employment equity and the other laws that outlaw discrimination to improve women's representation in executive leadership and address the gender pay gap. The United Nations states that globally one in three businesses is owned by women, but women only own 1% of procurement spent on large corporations. A panel discussion was done on how preferential procurement can help small firms achieve goals of equitable distribution of resources, enable sustainable development, and play a significant role in promoting gender equality and poverty reduction. When it comes to procurement, I'm very pleased to report that last year we procured 8.5 billion rand of goods from women-owned businesses. These are businesses that are at least 30% and more owned by women. And we see this as a journey, not an end, until we reach a stage where the economy is fully and truly transformed in substance and in form. What the NEF has done, we have a procurement finance product because we realize that as and when these uh, enterprises will be getting those uh, opportunities from various players, you know, within uh, the South African uh, economy, that you needed to have an entity that would be able to respond directly to that financing need. We are some of the participants, their suggestions on how the picture can be improved. If you apply the framework of uh, 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 effectively, it will literally bring an activity plan that will implement all these frameworks. And, and, and fortunately, as a country as well in South Africa, we are the signatures of these initi initiatives. And further down, it also makes sure that the private sector as well and the government fully understand how to implement the 40% uh, procurement public policies by South African government. We are in the digital world now where you need to make sure that in terms of the systems and everything, you are also far ahead. But that is the challenge that we have as women. We cannot be at the forefront because we also need the 
funding to ensure that we build our own platforms, to ensure that we have the resources and the capacity and the support and collaboration from everyone to make sure that we succeed. The launch of the Gender Impact Collaborative Fund, 20 billion or 1.2 billion dollars, for me is the highlight, like an umbrella fund. And we are saying the first quarter of 2023, come back, interview us, we'll tell you. Those ones that make commitment, what they have done and how the money has been utilized, which sector, how many people have been employed, how many communities have been changed, that's what we are going to talk about. Businesses from different sectors, together with government departments, pledge not only their support, but also resources and funds to the Women Economic Assembly in their continued initiatives to support women-owned businesses. From Pretoria, South Africa, Brian Pugeni, Channels Television News. And that's it on the program today and for the week. Thank you so much for watching. I'm Layo Olarinde. Have a lovely weekend.